Hello, my name is Keith Wiley, and this is my presentation, uh, Why a Whole Brain Emulation from Your Preserved Brain is Probably You. So this, to this talk is focused on the recent awarding of the Large Mammal uh, Preservation Prize by the Brain Preservation Foundation. So this is basically uh, a talk about specifically an attempt to emulate and ultimately upload um, a, a mind that is put into a preserved stasis and then scanned from that state. There are other kinds of mind uploading uh, sort of thought experiments, but this presentation is about uh, how we would perform um, whole brain emulation and, and perhaps uploading uh, from a preserved brain. So here's one way of defining these terms. Uh, whole brain emulation consists of building a functional model of a specific brain, whereas um, interpreting a whole brain emulation uh, as a preservation of an individual's personal identity is uh, called mind uploading. So mind uploading is sort of an issue of interpretation. Another distinction here is that whole brain emulation is a technical issue, concerns uh, physical issues. How do we actually capture the information uh, that, that represents how a brain is operating and how do we then engineer and compute and emulate that, uh, that, that physical process? Whereas mind uploading is a philosophical issue. You know, this is the, uh, the metaphysics of personal identity and uh, to some extent mind and consciousness, these other terms. Uh, so, it, like I said, one way of looking at it is that mind uploading is a matter of interpretation. If we interpret a whole brain emulation as a preservation of identity, then that is what mind uploading refers to. So, what are some of the positions that are held uh, with regard to whole brain emulation and mind uploading? So, here is uh, sort of an, an ordered list from uh, so from worst to best. So, first, there are there are stances that basically hold that uh, whole brain emulation is um, actually not technically possible. Uh, so 1A refers to a failure in which uh, basically something about the way brains work cannot be uh, adequately captured by, by other substrates or other computational artifacts. If we attempted to emulate a brain, it would just um, sort of not function properly at all. Now 1B is a slightly different failure. Um, we can imagine perhaps a, a scenario in which we are able to emulate a, a brain computationally, but uh, the, it, its behavior sort of is unconvincing when it comes to emulating an individual. We sort of don't feel in our interactions with this emulation that the individual person has survived and continues to exist in the emulation, that, that various psychological and personality and cognitive traits have not been preserved. Uh, then two refers to uh, a mode of failure, which is um, this idea that you might be able to produce a whole brain emulation which outwardly behaves as if everything works. It has the, uh, the behavioral mannerisms of not only of a human brain, but of a specific human brain. It seems to have successfully captured an individual person. And yet, uh, the, the concept of a philosophical zombie proposes that perhaps the whole brain emulation has no inner conscious experience. Um, the third uh, sort of position here, moving toward more optimistic um, or more accepting stances, um, Number three here refers to the stance that, that a whole brain emulation does work. It is, it is capturing human-like traits. It is actually capturing the behaviors of an individual, and it is also conscious. It's not a philosophical zombie, but it only represents some sort of identity copy. Uh, we say that a whole brain emulation in this, in this uh, third, um, uh, third point hasn't actually preserved the, the original person's identity. Uh, the identity has still been lost. The person has still died and the emulation represents a new identity. Uh, then the fourth point here is where we finally are able to, uh, to accept whole brain emulation as a successful preservation of identity, meaning successful mind uploading, but only under certain circumstances. Um, so if the procedure is performed in some ways, um, such as the popularly, popularly described gradual in-place replacement, then we might say that uh, identity has been preserved. But if it is performed in other ways, such as a scan and emulate uh, procedure, which is uh, discontinuous, and um, operates on a brain in stasis, then we might say, no, that wasn't good enough. Um, the identity died and was lost, and the emulation has produced a copy. And then finally, the fifth point is sort of the, the, the most optimistic or most accepting position, which would say that any whole brain emulation that seems to technically work captures human traits, captures an individual person's traits, exhibits that individual's uh, personality, is not only conscious, um, but also uh, uh, represents a preservation of identity of a particular individual, um, irregardless of what procedure was used to generate the whole brain emulation. So that would be successful mind uploading in, in any case there.
In my talk, I don't address um, the first two, uh, either technical impossibility or philosophical zombies. Um, now the second one is sort of, uh, we, we can't actually get at it. There's no way to test for lack of inner consciousness, so there's no point discussing it. Um, and uh, there's no point discussing it here at any rate in this talk. And the first one, technical feasibility, is just sort of, uh, sort of out of the scope of this talk. Um, how to actually technically emulate grain is, is a topic for a different talk. Um, consequently, um, uh, so the preservation of identity is really the consideration here, not technical challenges. And, um, and ultimately that means that only this issue of producing copies is the, the real problem that we're uh, debating. So I refer to this as the copy problem of, of whole brain emulation or of mind uploading. Um, this fear or concern that what you get is an identity copy and that identity is not preserved. And I consider the copy problem to actually be uh, a philosophical misnomer. I think that it um, is uh, uh, misunderstanding the nature of identity in, in a certain way. Um, and it is um, one of my goals in a lot of my writing and a lot of my speaking to try to um, convince people that, that this copy problem issue is, uh, is, is not very well posed. So how might we actually pres uh, emulate a brain? Um, here's uh, from a preserved brain. Um, so here's the basic approach here. We need to scan the preserved brain. Um, the most likely method would be to slice the brain up into, into two-dimensional sections and take two-dimensional images and then reconstruct a three-dimensional um, structural model of the connectome. Also, the connectome is how all the neurons are synaptically connected to one another. Once we have this model, um, we then uh, essentially functionally run or emulate the model somehow. And there are uh, two broad ways in which we might categorize these emulations. Uh, 3A here refers to a system which emulates the model uh, in a purely software system, some sort of supercomputer. You can see 3A here is a demonstrate an example. Um, but it doesn't actually have any physical uh, computational structure that mirrors that of the original brain. Uh, as opposed to 3B, where we can imagine that the emulation might be reconstructed into some sort of technical artifact, uh, like, like a sort of like a robot's brain from many science fiction examples, where the brain is um, sort of in a science fiction manner presumed to actually have a physical network topology that is somewhat akin to uh, the brain's physical topology. And I bring this up because some philosophers uh, care about this distinction. Um, they would say that uh, a, a pure software emulation is probably producing something like a P-zombie, uh, but that um, a physical computer network uh, at least has the potential for successful conscious emulation, identity preservation, and ultimately full-blown mind uploading. Other philosophers don't care at all about this distinction. And what are the ways in which uh, we might fail to preserve identity from a whole brain emulation? Uh, so I'll, this talk is going to talk about four possible ways. Um, uh, the concern that the emulation is imperfect, the concern that various continuity streams, either conscious uh, experience or neural activity, um, are, are broken, the streams are broken and then uh, restarted in another fashion. Uh, the concern, concern of how identity spatially relocates from the brain to the emulation's uh, physical system, the computer. And the concern of reduplication, which is a sort of an odd term from philosophy of mind, which is uh, more commonly known as uh, non-destructive uploading or non-destructive emulation. Um, in all cases, uh, remember, we're, we're really sort of considering the copy problem here, not, not technical problems. So we're, we're not, especially in, in number one here, there might be some confusion as to whether we're considering the, the possibility that uh, an imperfect emulation is not really working in a technical sense. And that's not, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, it's presumed that the emulation is, in fact, technically capturing the underlying neural functionality of the brain and the cognitive, psychological, and personality traits of the mind. Um, rather, there is this uh, occasion, sometimes proposed challenge that if an emulation is not uh, sufficiently perfect, even with the uh, uh, sort of personality seemingly intact, that only the identity is what has been lost um, and, and uh, that a new identity has been born. So again, we're only looking at the copy problem in all of these cases. So we'll just go through them one by one. So this first, uh, this first concern, imperfect emulation, uh, arises when some people say that they, they demand um, a perfect uh, sort of scan of the brain, even quantum mechanical in nature, um, before they will allow a judgment of identity preservation. So they basically want 
um, literally the quantum mechanical states of every single particle in the brain to be captured and uh, before they would consider an emulation to, um, to uh, represent identity preservation. An odd thing here is that these people are not always um, actually against mind uploading. They just have this uh, requirement of quantum mechanical precision. And, and the, the funny thing about this is that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle already rules out sort of their hypothetical uh, requirement. Um, you can't create a quantum mechanical, uh, quantum mechanically precise scan. Uh, you can't, you know, detect the, the location and the momentum um, of a particle. So these people who who would allow uh, judgment of identity preservation if quantum mechanics could be satisfied, but are still sort of on board with the idea in general, um, are are sort of um, in a bind. I, I don't think that uh, I don't think the requirement can be met. Um, it's probably better for them to just conclude that on the basis of their quantum mechanical requirement, what they really believe is that uh, identity preservation is just impossible anyway. Um, alternatively, they could abandon the quantum mechanical precision requirement, which is what I propose here. Um, there really isn't any clear evidence that our you know, sort of abstract psychological characteristics, which are you know then driven by underlying sort of neurophysiological behaviors and functions, that any of that really relies on the you know um, absolutely microscopic quantum mechanical effects uh, going on inside the, uh, the subatomic particles of the brain. Uh, there's really just no good reason to assume that yet. Um, in fact, to the contrary, our brains appear to be, to be uh, damaged in these ways on a continual basis. The radon we, in the air we breathe, cosmic rays, um, bricks and bananas and x-rays. Um, you know, the reason that a technician leaves the room when they give you an x-ray is that even with a lead vest, uh, you know, there's radiation leaking around the room. All of these forms of radiation um, certainly have the potential uh, to occasionally uh, sort of uh, transiently um, irradiate a subatomic particle in your brain and shift its quantum mechanical state in some fashion. Uh, and yet we don't judge these everyday effects to represent um, an erasure of our identity. There are also um, sort of much larger scale damages that occur to the brain. Um, concussions and cortisol generated uh, by our body in response to stress. and um, Aspartame, uh, curiously enough, um, some of these uh, uh, effects can actually kill whole neurons at a time. Um, you know, clearly, if a neuron dies, then all of the quantum mechanical subparticle states that were inside that neuron um, <clears throat> were obviously obliterated along with the neuron when it died. Um, and yet, we still don't deem you know these sorts of cases as identity erasure and new identity indication out of nothing. Um, we just don't regard one another or ourselves in this fashion. So. Uh, there's, there's something really contradictory here about requiring quantum mechanical precision to allow uh, sort of the judgments of identity preservation, and yet tolerating in our everyday lives all sorts of uh, damage, uh, both subatomic and, and you know, at a much larger scale, that's going on all the time. Um, and I think this contradiction uh, really needs to be squared before this quantum mechanical argument can be, uh, can be taken seriously. Another response to this quantum mechanical issue is to uh, this quantum mechanical uh, sort of requirement and challenge is to look at the technology of magnetic uh, resonance imaging. So this is a technology that is used to um, take images of or even videos of the brain um, in the in the fMRI sense, functional magnetic re resonance imaging. It's actually used to produce almost real time um, videos of, of what parts of the brain are active uh, in response to certain um, stimuli and tasks. And fMRI um, somewhat uh, sounds a little hokey to put it this way, but it's actually quantum mechanical technology. It uh, uses magnetism to manipulate um, certain quantum mechanical states of the brain, uh, specifically the spin angular momenta of the hydrogen nuclei of our uh, of, of the water of our uh, red hemoglobin um, cells. Uh, these these spin angular momenta are also called proton spins. So um, fMRI uh, magnetically brings all of these states into alignment and then releases them. If our personal identity depended on those same quantum mechanical states that fMRI, uh, if personal identity depended on, on, on the states that fMRI is, is um, fiddling with, then fMRI would be a metaphysical identity erasure machine. The person who enters an fMRI would vanish and some copy would uh, come into uh, existence suddenly. So one possible response um, to this fMRI um, um, sort of counter counter argument to the quantum mechanical identity theory uh, 
one response is to say that, well, you know, MRI isn't obliterating all of the quantum mechanical states, so maybe MRI is only affecting the ones that don't really matter, but, um, you know, the, the quantum mechanical states that are critical to identity are the ones uh, that MRI wasn't changing anyway. But that's, uh, that's somewhat, uh, that's a rather fortuitous argument. We're basically saying that when we invented MRI, we were just spectacularly lucky and, and sort of naive to have uh, invented a machine that might have uh, sort of accidentally been an identity erasure machine, and we, we just sort of luckily kind of missed the mark on that. Um, which I think is sort of a weak argument to say that, uh, you know, the reason that the MRI argument uh, doesn't successfully counter uh, quantum mechanical identity is, is that it was just sort of naively lucky. Um, also, uh, also, it's worth pointing out that uh, we couldn't possibly know. You know, how, how are we going to know whether MRI is, um, is erasing our personal identity or whether it is not erasing our identity? This is sort of a uh, an impossible question to address. Um, so instead of assuming that we dodged a bullet when we invented MRI and that it just uh, sort of luckily only affects the QM states that aren't relevant to identity, uh, a more reasonable conclusion of all this is that quantum mechanical identity is probably just not um, not a serious proposal in the first place. And finally, um, you know, the fact that there's no way to uh, you know, really detect or measure or, or much less falsify this idea. You know, we can't really figure out which quantum mechanical states are having some tangible effect on our identity and which ones aren't. Um, makes all of this a, an unfalsifiable theory. We can't really do anything about it, um, which means we should probably not take it too seriously. So the next objection is about continuity streams. Um, so the first one is a stream of consciousness. Um, people uh, sometimes say that they want their waking conscious experience to uh, represents some sort of unbroken stream. Um, and if that, if ever our consciousness ever sort of ceases and then restarts, then our identity has vanished and a new identity has popped up. Uh, and clearly in the case of identity, of, clearly in the case of brain preservation, um, uh, this, would, this would not count because, uh, you know, a preserved brain is an absolutely static physical object that clearly has no inner conscious experience because it's undergoing no dynamic sort of experience or evolution at all. So, you know, according to a stream of consciousness requirement, clearly the identity that was originally associated with the brain has vanished and a new identity has um, been, uh, been invoked when you, when you create an emulation of that brain. In response to the stream of consciousness, consciousness requirement, it's worth uh, sort of realizing that we already undergo various degradations in our conscious, uh, sort of level of conscious um, awareness. We fall asleep, we faint and pass out, we undergo medical general anesthesia, and in a few rare medical cases, um, uh, someone undergoes rapid frigid drowning, in which they um, uh, literally drown in an almost frozen lake uh, for upwards of an hour, uh, where the, uh, the cold temperatures actually prevent their body from decaying for a brief period of time, at least long enough to get them to a hospital, and they have survived the experience. Um, and, um, you know, the, the judgment is not that in any of those cases our identity has vanished. When confronted with this counter-argument, uh, the stream of consciousness uh, sort of line of line of thought uh, usually pivots in, the, in a very predictable manner. It wasn't really the consciousness stream that they were uh, concerned about. What they really meant was basal neural activity. They, they, they want the brain's physical neural function to be an unbroken stream of function. And, you know, if the, uh, if this sort of uh, collective neural activity were to ever cease and then start again, then the metaphysical identity would again sort of vanish from the original and, and a new identity would crop up when you restarted the neural activity. And again, of course, the, the judgment must be that although the brain is clearly being um, brought to a very low level of activity in the examples from the previous slide, general anesthesia and, and uh, rapid frigid drowning, um, that uh, you know the brain is certainly uh, still in a somewhat living in metabolic state in those cases, and we, we just judge that it did not drop below, um, you know, the, the threshold where identity would be lost. But again, there's a concern that a true brain preservation in its, you know, really static state is going to turn off too much activity in the brain, and that we will judge it as an identity loss. So the problem with the basal neural activity requirement is this threshold. How are we going to ever determine what this uh, purported threshold is? You know, what, what is the threshold of brain activity below which abstract metaphysical personal identity, this incredibly abstract uh, sort of philosophical concept, 
What, what, what is the neural threshold of activity below which this identity concept undergoes some sort of metaphysical vanishment? And if you were to then bring the brain's activity back up past the threshold, um, this metaphysical identity uh, would reemerge, but it would be a brand new one. You know, what, what kind of medical, neurological, you know, sort of brute physical threshold of activity could be correlated with something like um, metaphysical identity? And how could we ever determine what it is? How could we ever find such a threshold? How could we ever judge that we had dropped below the threshold or that we had successfully you know, sort of dropped just above the threshold and come back with our identity intact? How can we ever do any of this? Um, it really seems uh, sort of entirely outside the realm of physical uh, sort of measurements. And again, uh, so this is starting to sound uh, kind of like what I said earlier. This feels like an unfalsifiable claim and phenomenon. This threshold of neural activity um, is not scientifically approachable. And as I suggest here, perhaps the best conclusion to a, a totally unfalsifiable claim is that we should just not worry about it. Another problem is that it prescribes very strange behavior. Uh, you know, it suggests that we should point to a person, you know, perhaps a, a patient from a rapid frigid drowning um, medical emergency. We should point to them and we should, we should declare literally what we see written on the screen here, this preposterous statement that this person, uh, you know, according to my personal criteria of neural activity has, um, you know, undergone, um, you know, a travesty in which their brain dropped below my acceptable neural activity threshold. So now that person is a copy and you have to treat them as a copy, and I think they should even regard themselves as a copy, and that's how we should all, all treat this person for the rest of their lives. And my point is that um, I just don't think it's very realistic. I don't think most people would treat each other this way because they would have no indication that they should. Um, you know, when general anesthesia was invented, no one came along and said, okay, maybe we're erasing our identity. When the first rapid frigid drowning uh, you know, patient was revived, no one looked at that person and said, gosh, I don't know, I wonder if their identity is uh, you know, sort of gone and this is a new person. Um, we, we don't really have any good reason to, to start that conversation. Um, so, you know, examples like the quote shown on the screen here are, aren't really, really very realistic, in my opinion. Consider this hypothetical scenario. Let's say we determine that, um, you know, 50 degrees Fahrenheit is the threshold uh, of identity preservation. If your brain drops below 50 degrees, uh, you know, the brain shuts down too much and we lose our identity. So Alice drowns in a lake and she arrives at the hospital and her temperature is 52. Uh, so she didn't descend below the threshold, and the doctors revive her, and she lives a long life. But years later, the equipment is calibrated, and we discover that actually her temperature had dropped to 48 degrees all those years ago. And she's lived her entire life uh, uh, with everybody holding the wrong position uh, about her identity. Even she has the wrong, the wrong sort of belief about her identity. After all, the doctors told her uh, you know, she came back from 52 degrees, so she herself believed that she, that she was the original identity. And she was wrong, apparently, according to this theory. Um, and my point is simply uh, that this example shows that um, you know, this concept of the threshold and how we should regard it and how we should regard each other in response to uh, such a threshold um, I, I consider to be um, fairly unrealistic. So the third objection is this issue of spatial relocation. It is asked how the identity, um, which is, uh, I suppose, it, it is thought to be kind of rattling around inside your, your skull or something, um, it's got to get you know, sort of through space over to uh, wherever the emulation's physical substrate is, the computer. You know, how's it going to get over to the computer from your head? Um, I find this uh, uh, question somewhat ludicrous, but it does come up, and we, we have to uh, sort of figure out how to uh, meet it uh, because people seem to be concerned about it. However, I do think that one of the first responses is to just uh, quickly turn the question around, um, even, even if it won't uh, sort of convince anyone. I think it's worth asking why we have to take the question seriously. Why do we have to explain how identity moves through space instead of demanding that it be explained why it should be subjected to physical traits like spatial coordinates and motion in the first place? Um, it seems reasonable to, to put that on the table and say, no, wait, you know, if you're going to propose that identity has to move through space, then you have to address you know, everything that that suggests, such as you know, what sort of motion is identity subject to? Um, does identity have the traits of mass such that it has to accelerate smoothly? Um, you know, if there's, a, if there's a wall between the brain uh, that is being scanned and the, you know, the computer that is going to take the emulation, does it actually have to bank around a corner to get through space, um, you know, to the emulation? Uh, if it's in a strong gravity well, does identity sort of dip down? Now, I realize that this sounds facetious, um, but, but I'm not actually trying to come across sarcastically. 
I'm saying that when it is proposed that identity has to move through space from one place to another, that these are exactly the kinds of questions that arise. Um, you know, if we're going to take identities location in space and movement through space seriously, then we have to consider all the other things that would be imposed upon it uh, by being a spatial uh, concept or entity. And, um, you know, my point is that, um, not sarcastically, I just think this all sounds sort of silly. I think that identity um, simply doesn't work this way. Identity is not physical or spatial in the first place, and that's why we don't have to worry about how it moves through space. So this has been considered at depth, um, you know, for, for quite a while. Um, Derek Parfit, in his uh, famous book, Reasons and Persons, and other philosophers have, um, you know, asked this question, is identity um, sort of a physical concept or an abstract or pattern or informational concept? So if it's a physical concept, we refer to that as body identity, where an identity is associated with physical things, such as bodies or brains. Alternatively, um, with respect to the identity of people, which you call psychological identity, uh, where your identity is um, indicated by cognitive personality traits, not a physical thing such as the brain. Um, and this is sort of an open question in philosophy. Um, all the sort of uh, all the proposed models of identity can be challenged. Body identity has its weaknesses. Straightforward psychological identity has its challenges, although um, variants on it, I think, are, are some of the stronger versions. Um, but this is this is where this distinction comes up: is that some people have a more body identity uh, inclined philosophy, and that's why they're worried about how identity moves through space. And other people have a psychological identity model, where the identity is a, a cognitive aspect of the person's personality. It's this abstract thing. And that's why um, you know, concerns about location and motion through space by identity don't really make sense to people who subscribe to the psychology identity, the psychological identity um, position. Uh, so one way to look at this is that um, we already know that the brain is um, trading out its material components on a regular basis. This is often alluded to the ship of Theseus sort of thought experiment. Um, Sometimes people think this isn't the case because it's uh, sort of colloquially well known that neurons don't die off or, or get reborn too, um, too frequently in the adult brain. Um, there's some research to indicate there might be some of it, but certainly not a whole lot. Uh, but I think, I think some people erroneously think that means that the brain is uh, sort of physically sort of undergoing no change. Um, all that means that the neurons is, all that means is that the neurons themselves are undergoing sort of a, a ship of Theseus style interchange of uh, molecular uh, components. Um, after all, that's what metabolism is essentially doing um, to a significant degree. Um, so if uh, th this gives strength to the, the theory that um, it's not really the physical components that are carrying the identity, it's something about the, the pattern and way in which um, all these material aspects of the brain are, are connected up. Uh, so this leads us toward the psychological theory, the, the, the pattern theory of identity. But as I say here, you know, you know, patterns, again, are non-spatial. They don't have locations. They don't move. Um, curiously, they can multi-instantiate. So you can have a pattern for which there are two uh, physical systems um, in, in philosophy, a, a physical instantiation of one of these things called a token. You can have two tokens that instantiate the same um, sort of abstract concept, which is a, a type. Um, and uh, this, this, is, this is sort of what you get when you take a, a pattern or an informational or abstract approach to identity. So if identity is not subject to physical and spatial traits anyway, um, sort of as perhaps somewhat argued by the um, interchange of matter that the brain is always undergoing, then all the spatial location uh, questions, you know, how it moves from the brain to the emulation, all, all, all that challenge just kind of goes away. Um, in fact, I consider this to be something of a category error. Uh, where you assign traits of one category to a member of another category. So in this case, uh, physiospatial traits of location and motion have been um, incorrectly imposed upon something which is not physiospatial in the first place, which is a, a sort of personal identity. Another response, which Randall and I wrote up in a paper, um, starts with the uh, recognition of the fact that many people do actually accept the gradual in-place replacement procedure as uh, preserving identity. So this is the procedure, hypothetical, of course, a thought experiment, in which the neurons of the brain are slowly traded out one at a time by microscopic computational prosthetics. Um, and many people believe that if you did this, uh, the resulting physical artifact uh, inside your skull, this computerized uh, system, would represent a, an, an emulation and also an upload and a, a preservation of identity. It would have worked in all the intended ways. Whereas the scan and emulate approach where we take a frozen uh, or preserved brain, 
scan it and build an emulation from that in a discontinuous fashion. Uh, the, these same people who accept fragile in-place replacement will reject scan and emulate as um, destroying identity and producing a new one. And this is sort of the premise from which our paper uh, starts. So we consider a spectrum of procedures where gradual in-place replacement is at one end, scan and emulate is at the other, and in the middle there's this uh, third procedure, instantaneous in-place replacement, with uh, two sliding scales sort of tying the three, uh, the, the three procedures together. And our argument proceeds first by uh, showing that scan and emulate differs from instantaneous replacement only um, by the distance over which uh, uh, the procedure is performed. So in an instantaneous replacement pr uh, procedure, um, the distance is on the order of microns. You take this, uh, uh, it's not zero, incidentally. It's not that instantaneous replacement um, is truly in place. It's, it's just uh, in place within the skull, which is sort of a, a meaningless point of importance, in my opinion. Um, you, you take your prosthetic neuron that is going to replace a neuron, and you put it kind of next to the neuron, and then it observes and learns the neuron's function so that it can emulate it, and then at some later time, the biological neuron is killed and the prosthetic takes over the role. But the prosthetic did not actually occur in the same location as the neuron. It occurred next to it. So we can say that uh, you know the role or responsibility or ownership of that neuron's functional behavior um, you know, has been reassociated across a few neurons of space, across a few microns of space to the prosthetic. So there's still a non-zero distance. And in this case of scan and emulate, that distance is significantly larger. Of course, it's perhaps on the scale of meters if the brain that is being operated on is on one side of a room and the computer that will take over uh, responsibility for the emulation is on the other side of the room. And we question, you know, what difference does this distance make? Uh, if there were some distance that, that were uh, uh, of relevant difference, you know, how do we make sense of the, uh, the apparent threshold of distance um, where uh, there are profound metaphysical differences in interpretation? The second step of the argument um, ties the other two halves of the spectrum um, together. You know, gradual in-place replacement and instantaneous in-place replacement are associated with one another uh, by, by showing that it is merely a sliding scale of replacement rate. Um, you know, if you gradually replace 100,000 neurons a second, then you can uh, you know, finish the job in about 10 days. And if you uh, replace them at a rate of 100 billion per second, you can still uh, say that it's being gradually performed over the period of one second. Um, uh, but we could, we could actually extend this uh, right up to sort of the, um, to the limit of the reasoning. We could say that all of the prosthetics are injected into the brain. They all, um, uh, you know, find their host neurons and learn their functions, but, but they don't take over the role yet. And then with a single global switch from the outside, all the prosthetics take over uh, and, and the biological neurons are killed all in the exact instantaneous the same moment. And again, the question is, you know, what difference does this uh, sort of sliding threshold replacement rate make? Um, and um, you know, any viewers who are you know, sort of coming up with, with counter arguments to this, uh, sort of as you see my off-the-cuff presentation here, uh, I encourage you to actually look at that paper, which uh, goes through this in um, you know, fastidious detail and, and really um, uh, questions whether these threshold, proposed thresholds really would make any sense. The final step of the argument, of course, is to point out that what we've done with the first two points of the argument is tie all three of these together. So we should actually judge um, uh, gradual in-place replacement uh, with an equivalent identity status to that of uh, scan and emulate. It's, it's essentially a fallacy to judge the two of them differently. And you know, we can quickly say, well, what should that judgment be? You know, may maybe we should just say that gradual in-place replacement is actually not preserving identity either. But alternatively, of course, first of all, that's not really the goal anyone's shooting for. We, we want to believe that these procedures can work if they are performed um, correctly. And you know, a good point of evidence in favor of that is, again, to come back around to the recognition that uh, the brain is undergoing you know ongoing gradual replacement all the time anyway it's not replacing neurons it's replacing molecules but you know so be it uh, our identity seems to survive uh, you know sort of physical trade-off of matter um, so that gives good reason to believe that identity can be preserved in these cases and the fourth challenge um, is this issue of reduplication um, which is a, again it's, it's a term that doesn't come up uh, too often but it's um, it means exactly the same thing as non-destructive emulation or mind uploading. So let's consider a procedure where we can preserve a brain and then scan the connectomic structure out of it without slicing it up. Some sort of x-ray or MRI or PET-like or uh, MEG, some, some sort of scan or some futuristic extrapolation of a brain scan is able to 
glean the three-dimensional structure without actually damaging the brain. We could then uh, you know, proceed to create a whole brain emulation again, just as we would have. But of course, now we can revive the brain. You know, if the entire body was actually preserved, you know, we can essentially wake up the person. And um, you know, this is the, the philosophical uh, question that reduplication poses, or that non-destructive uploading poses, is what happens to the identity in this case. And a frequent judgment is that in a non-destructive case, the identity that we care about, the, the, the quote original identity, uh, remains stuck with the biological brain um, and that again, some sort of copy springs up in the emulation and that we should judge the whole thing as a complete failure to transfer uh, identity to the emulation. Um, although, of course, in this case, it isn't really so much a question of survival or, or death of the identity because we actually did revive the original person. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the question of whether identity has uh, been preserved into the emulation is, is sort of the, the question at hand here. But if identity lacks physical traits like location anyway, then to say that uh, identity is sort of inside the biological brain um, it, it is wrong, you know, sort of out of the gate. We need to stop thinking about it that way. Um, if we take the, the pattern approach or the in philosophy of realism, if we take the type and token approach and say that the, the mind or identity is a type and it is instantiated by some physical token that embodies the, the necessary patterns of that, of that uh, identity in mind, then all the tokens, all the physical systems that uh, you know um, hold the correct pattern, physical pattern that underlies those minds, that mind and identity, all those tokens are successfully doing the job equally. So the identity in question should be just as equally associated with the emulation as it should be with the brain. Um, uh, that, that, that's sort of the consequence of looking at it this way. But there's a good question, though. So what happened to our to our identity then? Um, you know, so we can say that the identity has been multi instantiated, but you know that, that sort of leaves this lingering question. Okay, well maybe we're willing to be a little bit less sort of biased about saying that the identity was was uh, you know stuck in the biological system or failed to attach to the emulation. But nevertheless, the question stands: um, What happened to the identity if we have this multi instantiation scenario? And the proposal is um, a theory of identity called branching identity. Uh, it, it relies heavily on this non-physical, non-spatial sort of approach. It's, it's a variant on psychological identity. I, you know, earlier I, I showed that Parfit used the terminology of body identity and psychological identity. Uh, branching identity is a variant on psychological identity, which still basically holds that identity is indicated by you know, the cognitive and personality traits of a person and not by the, uh, you know, the, the physical um, you know, the uh, atom and material components of the brain. Um, and uh, you know, clearly you can tell from the term that what branching identity is claiming is that you can get this sort of, um, you know, um, uh, other terms come up, or, or splitting, or fission, and all these words sort of come up when you, when you read about this, that an identity can in fact sort of yield two uh, child identities, but that it does so equally. Um, so the way that I like to, to uh, put this in my own writing is that all of the descendant minds of the common ancestral mind have equal primacy in their claim to the original identity. So what we're claiming is that it is essentially um, a bald-faced prejudice to grant, um, you know, sort of a greater importance to the point of view and and uh, uh, personal report of the mind associated with the brain than it is to to uh, you know hear the point of view of the mind associated with whole brain emulation. Now, why is it a prejudice? Because it comes back to the fact that um, we should not be giving any uh, specific importance to the physical. Um, you know, the tokens in question, the physical components, the brain or the computer in the first place. If the only thing we're going to rely on to indicate identity is psychological characteristics, then, um, you know, those psychological characteristics are equally represented by both systems. That's what branching identity is arguing for. And branching identity has uh, some major advantages. First of all, it respects the point of view claims of the people themselves. Um, there are occasions where we don't actually believe people's own uh, claims about uh, their own state of mind, uh, but we only do that when we have good reason to believe that a person suffers from some sort of psychosis, that we believe that they are essentially mentally ill. Um, but that is, of course, not what we're talking about here. We don't believe that an emulation's claims of, uh, you know, its own claims about its identity are wrong because the emulation is in any way mentally ill. In fact, uh, you know, sort of by the by definition of the terms of the, of the whole debate, the emulation is, in fact, producing the same, um, you know, sort of uh, 
uh, thoughts and beliefs and values of of the original brain. So you know, there, any any mental illness there would have been in the brain anyway. Um, so we we really should take seriously the individual subjective um, you know, uh, point of view of these people. It uh, helps us avoid bias um, and prejudice, which is sort of putting um, weight on bias, and discri discrimination, which is putting actions on prejudice and actually treating people differently. Um, you know, um, by honoring branching identity, we minimize the risk that we will uh, behave in these prejudicial fashions. Um, it avoids unfalsifiable phenomena. We, we don't have to uh, concern ourselves with um, proposed quantum mechanical aspects of identity. We don't have to concern ourselves with uh, thresholds of conscious or neural activity below which um, metaphysical identity uh, apparently would vanish. We don't have to worry about um, thresholds in um, replacement rate or thresholds in replacement distance. Um, these, all these things are unfalsifiable. We can't really determine how a metaphysical concept like identity would be affected by them. So they're unfalsifiable claims, and branching identity saves us from having to worry about them. Um, relatedly, in the fourth point here, it um, helps us avoid imposing additional properties on our metaphysics. So again, we don't have to impose uh, a quantum mechanical sort of bridge between the physical and the metaphysical. We don't have to impose continuity streams um, or conscious neural activity thresholds. Um, we don't have to make uh, category errors in our uh, sort of ass assignment of spatial properties to identity, and um, we don't have to make determinations about arbitrary replacement distance and rate thresholds. And finally, branching identity um, often, in, in, in as many cases as I've been able to find, handles the paradoxes that come up in these thought experiments much more smoothly than the other theories of identity. So I gave just one example of Alice, who, uh, you know, uh, went, uh, was uh, had a rapid frigid drowning emergency uh, uh, tragedy and was brought back and everyone including Alice believed that her identity was intact but then you know uh, paradoxically it was discovered later in life that everyone including Alice was wrong they held the wrong position about her identity and somehow Alice held the wrong position about her own identity um, again if you if you sort of take a branching identity approach to these things um, these paradoxes tend to go away uh, my book actually has um, a large collection of these paradoxes and, and interesting thought experiments in general that, that crop up when we think about mind uploading. So in conclusion, um, you know, sort of based on the line of reasoning that has been proposed in this talk, um, if you buy it, then there is good metaphysical reasoning to judge that a whole brain emulation of a scanned and preserved brain uh, truly preserves identity and represents survival of the person involved. Um, in other words, it represents uh, true mind uploading. Thank you very much.